what a, what a great group for a Wednesday uh, afternoon in September, yes. Uh, it's my privilege, I'm Jason Vickers uh, with the Wesley House uh, here at Truett Seminary, Baylor University. Uh, it is my privilege to welcome you all uh, to Truett and uh, to just bring a brief uh, word of greeting on behalf of the Wesley House. Uh, we are sponsoring, for those of you who have RSVP'd, uh, you know who you are. Uh, we are sponsoring a dinner afterwards uh, with Father Bear. Uh, so we'll look forward to that time together. I also need to take a moment and acknowledge our other sponsors for this event, uh, specifically uh, Truett Seminary, the Institute for Studies of Religion, the Catechist Institute, uh, and St. Nicholas Orthodox Church. I especially want to welcome Father Daniel Wright, uh, who's here with us today, and uh, as well as all of you. And now uh, I'd like to invite to the podium to uh, get things started, uh, to introduce our speaker, as well as the respondents, uh, Alex Fogelman with the Institute for Studies of Religion. Will you help me welcome Alex? Thank you, Jason. Um, let me add my thanks to Truett, especially Dean Still, uh, to Jason Vickers at the Wesley House for hosting us today, uh, especially to um, Nancy and the administrative staff that did all made this all look good. Um, our conversation today is centered around a critical topic, not only in Christian theology, but in our culture more broadly. Namely, what does it mean to be human? What is this creature we call the human? And what does it mean to be made in the image of God? To help us wrestle with this question today, we're delighted to have Reverend Professor John Baer with us, who will be giving the keynote presentation. He'll present for um, 50 minutes or so, however long uh, he does. <laughs> um, enough time to, I think, provoke a few questions or two. Um, and we're also delighted to have Dr. Natalie Carnes uh, here from Baylor in the Religion Department and Dr. Thomas Breedlove from the Institute for Studies of Religion who are gonna offer responses to Father Bear's work. I'll introduce them in due time. Now let me uh, say a brief word about Professor Bear. He's the Regis Professor of Humanity at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland having served for 25 years or so at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary in New York, where he was the dean for many years and where he also edited the well-known popular patristics series, which has done so much to make the church fathers available to English-speaking audiences. Um, he's worked extensively in the first three centuries of the Christian church. Um, many of us here have likely encountered the great work of Athanasius uh, on the incarnation in John Baer's translation of that text. More recently, he provided a new translation and extended introduction of Origins on First Principles, another central work in Christian theology. He also works a lot on the Gospel of John and the second century theologian Irenaeus of Lyon, all while reading a good dose of French phenomenology on the side. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I've come to really appreciate about Professor Baer's work is this careful attention to the nature of theological language. Rowan Williams has once remarked that theology is perennially tempted to bypass how it learns its own language. As a result, the questions we bring are not always the ones being asked, are not always answered in the way we expect, but precisely in being open to this surprise, we open ourselves to real illumination. That's the case, I think, with Professor Baer's most recent publication, which he'll be drawing on today. It's this lovely new <coughs> volume from Oxford University Press. It's a new edition and translation of St. Gregory of Nyssa's treatise, which Professor Baer has titled On the Human Image of God, which you may have encountered before as On the Making of Man, or De Hominis Apificio, if you're a good Latinist, like uh, you should be. Of all, this is fast. Of all of Gregory's works, there's some 60 works, about 3,000 pages or so. Um, this is the only one that's not ever appeared in a critical edition. 
And the last translation appeared some 200 years ago. So it's truly a remarkable achievement to have this work. Uh, it's a gift not only to the scholarly community, but also those who are interested in this question about theological anthropology. What does it mean to be human? So we're so delighted to have you here, Professor Baer. Uh, please help me welcome. So the, the, the very fact of a book called the Bible is the invention of truth and us. And there's all sorts of modifications that have gone on with it. The title, the Bible. Okay? Well, in Greek, it is tabithia, the books. So you've really changed from the plural to the singular. Something's happened. Okay? I'm starting with this. I will get to Gregory. I'm not going to get too sidetracked. But if you want to understand what Gregory is doing in terms of on the human image of God, we're going to have to think about scripture in a slightly different way. So, the book. Become, the books become the book. But now, most particularly, think about it. Every Bible we've got is divided into Old Testament and New Testament. I think. I've never seen one which isn't. And that kind of forces you to read, you know, Genesis onwards, the history of Israel, all the different things that happen. And then if you want to know about Jesus, when you turn to the New Testament and you read the lives of Jesus, the fourfold life of Jesus in the Gospels, then you have Acts, then you have the letters of Paul. It's laid out for us like that. And because it's laid out for us like that, we read along that kind of implied narrow time of mind and think we're being historical. You know? But we're not. We're absolutely not. First of all, that we call it the Old Testament. It's a real problem. Christ refers to it as the scriptures. The Apostle Paul refers to it as the scriptures. The evangelists refer to it as the scriptures. The Nicene Creed calls it the scripture. Christ died and rose and called it the scripture. If it's a good enough name for Christ, Paul, the evangelists, and the Nicene Creed, it's probably good enough. Okay? 
That we call the Old Testament means we relegated it. We pushed it back to be about the things before Christ. So undoubtedly, those scriptures were written in, in the thousand years whenever before Christ. No doubt about it. Um, they were written in whatever circumstance they were written. They gathered together. They were edited. They were lost. They were found. All those kind of things. However, all of that happened, and I don't mean to just diminish the study of all of it. It's incredibly valuable. Because these are all texts written in ancient languages from 1,000 years ago. You've got to study all of the historical disciplines to get there. Okay? But on the other hand, the Apostle Paul knew all of those scriptures and did it leading to Christ. He read those scriptures as a first century Jew. Did it lead him to Christ? No. It led him to persecute Christians. Yeah? So his reading of those scriptures under you know, in a, in a better way than I'm ever going to be able to do it, as a first century Jew trained under whatever Pharisaic tradition he's been trained under, it led him to persecute Christians. He then encounters Christ in the road to Damascus, all that's involved with that, and then he starts reading scripture differently. Okay, so the text hasn't changed, but his way of reading has changed. So historically then, you know, <coughs> the scriptures, we call the Old Testament, I'm really trying to urge people to stop using the word Old Testament. Call it scripture, good enough for Christ. You've got the scriptures, you've got the passion of Christ, and then you've got what Paul would say is the unveiling of the scriptures. The veil has been lifted. Now we can see what they were taught, what the glory that was hidden under Moses, all that kind of thing. Okay, or the road to Damascus. You know, the encounter there is in Lord is only when he opens the scriptures, they finally say, oh, Moses and all the prophets we're speaking about how I have to suffer to enter my glory. You've got the scriptures, you've got the passion of Christ, you've got a new way of reading those scriptures. You then have the proclamation of the gospel. You then have Paul's letters. And then you have the fourfold gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So historically, that would be the order. Yeah? Scriptures, unveiling, proclamation, letters, gospels. Historically, that's the order. Hermeneutically, that's the order. You understand through the unveiling, resulting in the proclamation, correct letters from Paul, and then the elaboration of the gospel as Matthew presents it, Mark presents it, and so on. Okay? Which have got further implications which we're not going to go into now. Um, it's historical order, it's a hermeneutical order, it's a liturgical order for those who have a liturgical tradition. Almost every liturgical tradition, the Old Testament scripture is read. You see the beginning of the form, you see the beginning of the service, then Paul, then the Gospel. So if it's a historical order, the liturgical order, and the hermeneutical order, why on earth would you read it in any other way? Yeah? So that's what I mean by the problem with the Gospel. Now, uh, with the Bible, to present it to the Bible. So I think we've got to learn to think, to go back from Bible to think about Scripture. Okay. Now, the reason for emphasizing this is because it implies a very different way of reading scripture. You've got these scriptures, it's unveiled in the light of the passion, you're reading it differently. So Christ's passion really is the end of the narrative. Yeah. The way we have it, it's like a midpoint. All the Old Testament, then what we call the incarnation, and 30 years later the crucifixion, and a few days later the, the resurrection, the ascension, and history continues. No. The passion, the crucifixion, the resurrection is at the end point, the veil is lifted. And you're now reading from the point of view of the end. The way that early Christian writers, like Irenaeus, would speak about it is that the writings of the apostles, the, the, the letters, um, the gospels, are a recapitulation of the whole of scripture. It's in Irenaeus' work. I gave a lecture one time, ages ago now, on Irenaeus and recapitulation. Um, and afterwards, a student came up to me and said, if only you had used the word recap, we would have known what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used the word recapitulation just then, and you know, your mind start thinking about jargon and you know, theological visions and all the rest of it, but it simply means recap. What we've got in what we call the New Testament is a recap of the whole of Scripture seen the length of the cross. Okay? Because after all, Moses and all the prophets were speaking about how Christ had to suffer to enter into his glory. Well, that's what Paul and the Gospels are talking about. It's a recap. The Gospels are not what happened next. Yeah, the, the passion, the unveiling, the proclamation. Now, really funny things happen when you start to read it that way. 
when you start to read something from the point of view of the end, a whole different perspective then opens up. Okay? The clearest example of that, this is a phenomenon of fair scripture, the clearest example is in Genesis. You know, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers, sinfully, passionately. They're jealous, they sell him into slavery. No doubt about it. You carry on reading, there turns out to be a famine later on with the man, the brothers come down to ask for food, and what does, when they, when they approach Joseph there, they're fearful to approach him because they know what they've done. But do you remember what Joseph tells them? Anybody? What do you take for evil, God, from the good? So it is not you who sent me here, but God. Well, which is it? You know, which is it? The end opens up a perspective which is not known during the course of the narrative. Yeah? And you cannot flatten those two narratives into one. Which is what we're always tempted to do. But you cannot flatten it into one. It's not as if somebody could have told Joseph, don't worry, God's with you, he's going to sort it all out, everything's going to turn out fine, God's at work shaping up. And you can only get that by the end. It would ruin the narrative if you told it in the, in the middle. We had exactly the same thing going on in the proclamation in, in Peter's pro proclamation in Acts, where Peter says, This Jesus, who you crucified by the hands of lawless men, nevertheless was given up according to the predetermined plan of God, seen from the point of view of the end. Okay, got all of that. So it opens up a perspective, the beginning and the end, open up a perspective which is also the below and the above. The human way of seeing it, the divine end way of seeing it. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because that's a framework, then, for the Christian proclamation from the beginning. Already with Corinthians 15, when after Paul spoke about death and resurrection, he then immediately draws his parallel. Adam, Christ. The first Adam, the second Adam. The Adam who's animated by a breath of life, the Christ who's a life-giving spirit. It's a movement from one Adam to the new Adam, from the Adam of, of animation to the life-giving spirit. And it's also a movement from below to above, the one from earth, the one from heaven. Okay, so the proclamation in the night of the cross, finishing scripture, unveiling scripture, opens up this fourfold matrix, beginning, end, below, and above. And that's a matrix within which, scripture, within which Christian theology was really working from the beginning. Okay? And, and you can probably tell that that's so because you've got a prescription in the mission in, in the Jewish uh, the rabbinic sources, probably coming from really quite early, who says anyone who gives their mind to what was before time and what was after time, what is below and what is above, it's better that he never came into the world. Yeah? But it's absolutely essential to that proclamation. First heaven, now seven, now in birth, now in heaven. Okay? Rather than a long narrative, which we think is, you know, long man of history, and then history carrying on like that. Okay, so, um, before we turn to Gregory, I just want to give a couple of examples from two, early Christian, two earlier Christian writers on the question of anthropology. And then we can turn to Gregory and look at what he, how he puts it all together in this kind of life that I've been talking about. So the first quotation is from Ignatius. Ignatius of Antioch, writing probably about the year 100. He's going from Antioch to Rome to be martyred. And he writes to the Christians in Rome, basically telling them, whatever you do, don't interfere with my coming martyrdom. Don't bribe the judges. Don't try and talk me out of it. Yeah? And then he says, Birth pangs are upon me. Allow me, my brethren, this is quotation number one issue. Allow me, my brethren, hinder me not from living, do not wish me to die. Allow me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I will be a human being. Allow me to follow the example of the passion of my God. It's a remarkable statement. Because what he does, he undermines everything that we think about ourselves. He's saying, both hands are upon me. He's not yet been born. 
Yeah? Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. When he says, hinder me not from living, he's saying, don't try and talk me out of my master. So it's not yet allowed. Okay? Allow me to receive the light. When I will arrive there, I will be a human being. So he's not yet born. He's not yet living. He's not yet human. Everything that we think about ourselves, he radically undermines. Yeah? Not yet born, not yet living, not yet human. There's all sorts of background for that, especially the Gospel of John. But before I come to that, just think about it for a moment. You know, we tend to think we've been born into life and we are free. Well, none of us had any choice about coming into existence. You know, there's a Dostoevsky wrote a book called The Possessed, and in that one of his characters, Kirillov, protests that matter. Nobody asked me if I wanted to be born. We had no choice about the matter. We're thrown into existence, and we're thrown into existence in which whatever we do, we're going to die. Yeah? It sucks. <laughs> yeah? It really does. No choice about it. We are as good as dead from the beginning. We might be able to postpone our lives a little bit, but we're as good as dead from the beginning. The difference between being born and coming into existence is that to be born is to be born into life. You know, a, a building can be built, it's coming into existence, but it hasn't been born. To be born is to come into life. Well, in that sense, we haven't been born, because we're in death. Yeah, whatever we do, we're going to die. We came into existence, but we're going to die. Then, to be born is to come into life. So we're not yet born, we're not yet living, and he would say we're not yet human. Okay? This is directly within Paul's paradigm of beginning and end. The first chapter is animated by a breath of life. But what does a breath do? It expires. That's what a breath does. As long as we keep trying to hold on to our breath, we're going to die. As Christ said, if you try and preserve your life, you lose it. No matter how much you, how well you hold on to it, you know, your breath will expire. But, he says, if you lose it for my sake, for the kingdom, for the gospel, you gain it. Okay? Actually, in Luke it says, you will beget life. So we, it's a movement from breath to life. You gain it because you've now entered into a mode of life which can't be touched by death because you've entered into it through death. And it's simple as that. Okay. So let's move on from first Adam to last Adam, from breath to life giving spirit. But then the question why is he not yet human? I think the reason why, and we're going to see other people who do this, but you can find it all over the place. The reason why he says that, and this is why I drove me back to the Gospel of John to figure out what's going on here, is the backgrounds in the Gospel of John. Okay? Um, <coughs> We've got really good grounds for thinking, but for various other reasons. But it's specifically in the relationship between the Gospel of John and Genesis. Okay. Now, John tells you when he writes his Gospel that he's going to be playing with Genesis. Yeah, the opening words of John's Gospel, John's Gospel, in the beginning. So he's telling you, if you want to understand my Gospel, you've got to read it alongside Genesis. So when Christ is finally crucified in the Gospel of John, and it's only in the Gospel of John he says this, his last word on the cross is, it's finished. Now we tend to hear that along the lines of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you know, my work is come to an end, into thy hands I command my spirit, all of that kind of language. But in the Gospel of John, it's not simply it's finished, it's come to an end. The Greek word is tetelestai. It's perfected. It's brought to completion. So the question then is, well, what is being perfected and what is brought to completion? And the answer lies in Genesis. So in the beginning, in the beginning, go back to Genesis 1, see what's going on in there. And then it becomes striking that in Genesis, it starts by God speaking everything into existence. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. It's good, this is done, end of the day, next day. God speaks everything into existence with a divine imperative. Let it be. And then he changes into a subjunctive. Let us make. Yeah, we all think of the Trinity and all of that. But the interesting thing is not a change from the singular to the plural. The interesting thing is it's a subjunctive. It's a project. So having brought everything into existence, we've spoken everything into existence by, by the divine word, 
He then announces his project, let us make. And the project is to make the human being in his image. It's a project. And that, I think, is, a, is what is concluded when Christ from the cross says, it's finished, it's completed. And actually, in the Gospel of John, you've got the giveaway because Pilate says, behold the human being. Yeah? So Genesis starts off with, let it be, seeing is, is set, let us make a human being, behold the human being. It's finished. Ignatius, let me go to my master, let me follow the passion of my God, and I too will be born into life, which can't be touched by death, and emptied through the food death, and I will be a human being. Does that make any sense? Yep. Okay. So, following the councils in Chalcedon, we know Christ shows us what it is to be God. And he also shows us what it is to be human. There's the truth about humanity, the truth about divinity shown to us in the one person of Christ. He shows us what it is to be God, not by working miracles. The disciples saw those miracles and didn't get it. He shows us what it is to be God by the way in which he dies as a human being, voluntarily giving his life for others, for the life of the world. That's how he shows us what it is to be God, conquering death by death, all the things that especially John plays out. But that means he also shows us what it is to be human in that way. What it is to be human is not to live for oneself, is not to try and hold on to the breath of life. What it is to be human is to live by voluntarily taking up the cross, laying down your life for your neighbor, the gospel of the kingdom. Does that make any sense? See? So what we're invited to do, to the only work which is said to be God's own work, everything else is let it be, let it be, let it be, let us make. We are the ones who've got to say let it be. And we say let it be by taking the cross, following Christ, laying down our life and love for our neighbor. And by doing that, we change, in Christ, we change the ground of our existence from necessity and mortality which is how we came into existence. No one asked me, no choice about it, and going to die. We came into existence as passive victims of mortality, but now in Christ, we can actively turn that mortality into a mode of life, taking up the cross, not living for myself, but living for others. Now, that also has a really remarkable implication that if that is what it is to be human, to live by voluntarily laying down your life in an act of love, then actually God could not have said, let there be a human being. Because it wouldn't be one who's voluntarily living by an act of love. He can create those who come to say that, but are not yet that. Okay? So the ones that are able to take up their mortality, voluntarily respond to God and say, let it be, to the only work that God has said, is said to be God's own work. Okay, so that's what I think is going on behind the quote of Ignatius, and it, it's wild. Okay. But it's, it's absolutely there all over the place. So, Ananias, quotation number two. Okay. Now, most of that is one sentence. Actually, most of that is half a sentence. Because you've got dot, dot, dot at the beginning. Yeah. And just to see how this sentence works, I've had to put it in bold and underline it. Okay. But he's going to express exactly the same kind of vision. We need to have this in our mind before we turn to Gregory. He says, just as from the beginning of our formation in Adam, the breath of life from God, having been united to the handiwork, to the clay, the plasma, animated the human being, animated, breath, anima, breath, soul, you know, animated the human being, and showed him to be a rational being. So also, at the end, the word of the Father and the Spirit of God, having become united with the ancient substance of the formation of Adam, rendered the human being living and perfect, bearing the perfect Father. So it's from the beginning in Adam, animated by a breath, united with the word and spirit at the end to be vivified. Movement from breath to spirit. Movement of Corinthians 15. Okay. Just as so also, in order that, just as in the animated we all die, a breath expires, so also in the spiritual we shall all be vivified, 
river breath to spirit again. For never at any time did Adam escape the hands of God, to whom the Father speaking said, Let us make a human being in our image after our likeness. And for this reason, at the end, not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the good pleasure of the Father, at the end, his hands perfected a living human being in order that Adam might become in the image and likeness of God. So being in the image and likeness of God is eschatological. It's at the end. It's not a starting point, it's the end point. And for the whole of time, Adam never escaped the hands of God, being molded all the way through time so that at the end, moving from breath to spirit, moving from Adam to Christ, we may have the, the, the living human being who's in the image and likeness of God at the end. Okay? Um, yeah, this movement from breath to spirit. But also, in that last thing, in order that Adam might become in the image and likeness of God, just hold that passage in your mind for now. Is he talking about a particular individual? Is he talking about the whole of the human race? Okay? Adam, which is it? Is it both? What's going on? It's not really quite clear in that sentence. We're going to see that play that further in vain. So Adam understands the movement from Adam to Christ, from beginning to end, of being one of growth, one of pedagogy, one of being molded. Another example there is quotation number three. He's got this lovely way with words, speaking of things as a, a rhythm, as a melody, as a symphony. So he said, by such, by this order, in such rhythms, and such a movement, the created and fashioned human becomes in the image and likeness of the uncreated God. The Father planning everything well and commanding, the Son executing and performing, the Spirit nourishing and increasing, and the human being making progress day by day, ascending towards perfection that is approaching the uncreated one. For the uncreated is perfect, this is God. So the Father planning, the Son executing, the Spirit is nourishing, we are grown. <coughs> and then he puts it this way. Now it's first necessary for the human being to be created. Having been created to increase, having been increased to become an adult, having become an adult to multiply. Having, been, having multiplied to become strong, having been strengthened to be glorified, having been glorified to see his master. For God is he who is yet to be seen, and the vision of God produces incorruptibility, and incorruptibility renders one close to God. You know, I've read and taught Irenaeus at least once a year for almost 30 years now. And it's only this past year that it dawned on me that he's naming seven stages in that. That's why I put the numbers in there. Yeah. So it, it's, it's remarkable. using the, the, the pattern, the seven stages of human life, which go back to the Greek doctor Hippocrates. Um, and you can find it everywhere, Shakespeare, obviously. All these things. It's the seven stages of human life. And he's using the seven stages of human life to map out the seven ages from Adam to Christ from the beginning to the end. So it's using the, the model of our, hum, our particular human life and then seeing it a bit large. We've got, to, we've got to be created, we've got to grow, we've got to increase, we've got to multiply, we've got to be strengthened, we've got to be glorified, or whatever the seven stages were. Does that make any sense? Okay, are your minds sufficiently turned around enough so that we can now turn to Gregory? So I spent the last five, actually I spent 25 years working with Greg, I wrote an article in this text back in the 1990s, dissatisfied with the way that people are reading it, and they've been working with it ever since. Then during lockdown, I thought, okay, now's the time, let's do that edition, let's do that translation. And while I was doing that, I was preparing to write the introduction, I was reading through all kinds of background material, and especially reading through Plato's Timaeus. Okay. Now, the Timaeus was the most important philosophical text in the ancient world regarding creation and the human place within it. Okay, it's all the way through the Middle Ages, it's the most important, really the most important topic. And people have always said, you know, Gregory, his work on the making of man, on the human image of God, is like the Timaeus, and left at that. But as I kept on working with it, and translating, and editing, and writing introduction, it dawned on me that what Gregory is doing actually parallels the structure of the Timaeus. So, we know that Gregory was capable of doing that. He's writing in the late 4th century, Cappadocia. 
He wrote a work called On the Soul of Resurrection, which is a deathbed scene dialogue with his sister Macrina as she lies there dying. She, he, she's instructing him not to grieve and all those kind of things. And it's a direct rewriting of Plato's fiber. Yeah? So Greg is able to take these ancient forms and play with them. And then it occurs to me that actually maybe this is what he's doing in On the Making of Man. So I'm going to say a quick word about, about Plato's Timaeus. And then we're going to turn to Gregory, what he does with that, and how he um, kind of continues the reflection on the human being that we saw very briefly, I spent days on it, in Ignatius and Agonides. Okay? Coming out of that apocalyptic way of reading scripture, from the point of view of the end, the veil being lifted, Adam to Christ, of which the writings of Paul and the Evangelists are a recapitulation, not what happened next. Okay? Yeah, that's okay, let's go to the Timaeus. So Timaeus is invited to talk about the creation of the world and events in it, uh, and the human being in it. And he starts off by giving a dis discussion, a discourse about how uh, the world is the most beautiful of all things, and God being the bountiful creator wouldn't have wanted to make it any less, so he looked at the best of all ideas in order to create the best of all possible world. Simply, no, yeah, a lot of complicated stuff, but essentially that's what it is, for our purposes. Then quotation number four. He comes to a certain point in his dialogue, and then he stops himself. And he takes it up again. So he says, Now in all but the brief part of the discourse I have just completed, I have presented what has been crafted by intellect, by loose. You know, so the best of all worlds, think about the, look at the best plan and doing the best thing. That's what I've done so far. But I need to match this account by providing a comfortable one concerning the things that have come about by necessity and anger. For this ordered world, for our concrete actual ordered world, is of mixed birth. It is the offspring of a union of necessity and intellect Intellect prevailed over necessity, persuading it to direct most of the things that come to be towards what is best. And the result of this subjugation of necessity to wise persuasion was the initial formation of the universe. So the intellect is persuading necessity. And our actual world is a product of both of these forces at work. Persuasion. It becomes such an important topic in patristic theology. If God is omnipotent, we shouldn't understand that in terms of a competing power struggle where God stamps his will. If God is omnipotent, it's by the wise persuasion that he exercises through weakness. It's by his weakness that strength is revealed. It's really, really, really interesting the connections. So he carries on. So one is to speak of how it really came to be in this way, how the world really came to be in this way. One would have to also introduce a character of the stream cause, of how it's his nature to set things adrift. I should have to retrace my steps then, and arm the second starting point that also applies to these same things. I must go back once again to the beginning and start my first inquiry from there, just as I did from my earlier one. So he's got to go back to the beginning. He's given one account. He's got to go, now go back to the beginning, start again, and give another account because the world is of mixed birth, reason, persuading, necessity. Okay? So he does all of that, all sorts of weird and wonderful things go on with that. And then at the end, creation number five, he turns to a third part of his work. And he says, now that we've sorted out the different kinds of cause, which like many before us, like lumber for carpenters, from then we're able to weave together the remainder of our account. So a third part of this discourse. So let us return briefly to our starting point and quickly proceed to the same place from which we arrived at our present position. Let us try to put a final head on our account, one that fits well with our previous discussion. Okay. Um, now what follows is rather of a particular character. One of the best interpreters of the Timaeus, Colford, in his commentary on the Timaeus, says, at one point he says, the Timaeus is really difficult reading but most readers will find what follows after this point to be repulsive. <laughs> yeah. Because it's full of ancient medical details. 
that he goes on and on and on, you know, about how the spleen is related to the kidneys, related to the heart, and what the lungs are doing, what the arteries are doing, and how all of these different things affect it, what happens when parts are diseased, and all the rest of it. My only point would be, what he's actually talking about hereafter is a particular human being, and how the particular human being is constituted. So he's given us two accounts. Reason, what things look like according to reason, the blueprint. Persuasion, reason persuading necessity, setting correct the straying cause. And then he brings these two accounts together under one head to describe the particular human being. Yeah? So they're kind of metaphysical accounts which describe what is actually actual, which is you know, a particular human being. Okay, so let's turn to Gregory. Gregory starts off his account um, on the human image of God. You know, then introduction left to the introduction material. But in the first 15 chapters, he gives a really beautiful picture of the human being. Okay? And I've got some passages for us to, just to look at. He starts off by talking about the whole world as being a machine. So a very particular understanding of creation. He says, God's act of creation is instantaneous. God is not a technical being. It's instantaneous and it unfolds in time. Okay? Time is a measure of the creation's unfold. So he says, these moreover were, uh, no, no, no. These were, were thrown forth before others according to the wisdom of the maker as a kind of beginning of the whole machine. As the great moves indicated, I think, by saying that the heaven and earth were made by God in the beginning, so that all things appearing in creation are the offspring of rest and motion brought to genesis in accordance with the divine will. There's rest and motion, the tension within creation that's producing this kind of movement of creation guided by the divine will, which brings all things into being at their proper time. Okay? Instantaneous creation unfolding like that. Um, he then carries on describing the, 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 the world, the tension for the movement within the world, tradition of seven. These words were formed first before others according to the wisdom of the maker as a kind of beginning of the whole machine. It's a bit more simple. Um, the theme of creation. It, it carries on all the way through chapter one, the very bottom line on page one. All the wealth of creation by land and sea was ready, but there was none to share. Okay, so the whole of creation is brought into being, everything's moving, everything's in tension, interplay between movement and tension brings the genesis of being, but as yet there's none to share. Okay, top of page two. For that great and honourable thing, the human being, had not yet occupied its place in the world of being as well as not yet reasonable for the ruler to appear before the rule, but with the dominion first made ready, it was consistent for the king to be presented. So the whole world had been brought together, there's none yet to share it, but it's ready for the human being. Um, so he carries on, the creation of the page. The rich and munificent host of our nature, when he had adorned the dwelling place with beauties of every kind, and made ready this great and varied banquet, then introduces the human being. It's striking the energy that introduces, but it's not dissimilar to the way that we talk about ourselves coming into the world. Yeah, when we're born, we say we come into the world. We don't say we're created, we say we're coming into the world. Something's going on with that. He then introduces a human being, giving him, his, giving him as his work, not the acquisition of things absent, but the enjoyment of things present. And for this reason, he established for, establishes for him a twofold origin of formation, blending the divine with the earthly, so that by means of both he may congenitally and appropriately have enjoyment of each, enjoying God by means of the more divine nature and the good things of the earth by the sense of kingdom. Okay. Um, this is going to be a small passage to, 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 to discuss. It carries on this way, quotation number nine and ten. Only for the formation of the human beings to make of all draw near with circumspection, so as to prepare beforehand for the material for destruction should like his form some archetypal beauty. Everything else is created to be off the cuff. Let it be, let it be, let it be. But this is the Christ, uh, God draws near with circumspection, plans all of this, uh, and likens his form to some archetypal beauty, setting before him the goal for which he will come to be. So it's, you, you come into existence with a goal, something to aim at. To craft from the nature appropriate for him and appropriate for his activities suitable to the project. 
Council in quotation number 10, Council perceives the formation of the human being, what it and what he will be is foreshadowed by the artist through the writing of his account. What kind of being is fitting he should be, to what architect should bear likeness, for what purpose should come to being, and having come to be, what activity and what rule, and what he shall rule. All these things the account, the logos, lays out beforehand, so that he is a rank assigned before his genesis, possessing rule over beings before his coming into being, for God says, let us make a human being in accordance with that image. So he ends on talking about that. He talks about um, uh, the advantages of the body, the way that our body is structured. He goes on and on about that. He mentions, for instance, we've got fingers. Yeah? Well, we've got fingers, he says, so that we've got mouths that can talk. So you know, even the very fact of our having fingers is part of our body formation adapted for a proper rational being. If we didn't have fingers, our mouths would have to be adapted for, for gnawing and grazing grass or chewing bones. So fingers enable speech. He said, I'm not actually going to tell you what I mean by that, but you work for that. He talks about the fact that we're on two legs. Yeah? We're on two legs so that we look upwards rather than four legs looking downwards towards you. Mm. Yeah, all sorts of things like that. And then he does, he does some really interesting things when he's doing that. He talks about how we come into existence as the weakest of all animals, yet our task is to rule over other animals. And so the way that we rule over other animals is by soliciting their cooperation. So the dominion that, as he understands, is not, you know, powerful exercise, but rather it is by soliciting cooperation because we're weak and we need their assistance. So in fact, the model he's got is a model of Paul, of Christ's strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah, so when we hear dominion, it's not the kind of thing you usually hear, strength in weakness. He carries on with all of that. And then he catches himself, just like Phineas does, and says, well, actually, I could talk about the body, but I should have talked about the soul, first of all, because the soul is more important than the body. So he carries on, quotation number 11. He says, 11 and 12. He says, but it seems to me that by these points, Moses reveals a certain doctrine about hidden things and secretly delivers a philosophy concerning the soul. So Genesis 1 is all about the philosophy concerning the soul, in case you didn't realize it. Okay? That's fourth century Greek reading. Which outside learning also imagined, but it did not clearly comprehend. Through these things, the account teaches us that the vital and animating power, the soul, anima, animating, is contemplated in three divisions. One is simply growth and nutrition. Supplying what is suitable for increase of those being nourished, which is called vegetative, and is contemplated in plants. Vegetables have got souls. Okay? Now, I know that doesn't really work with how we use the language today, but for the Greek world, we're talking about soul is really the animation within the animate. Yeah, that's really the best way of thinking about it. And it's way of categorizing. You've got, you've got a rock, you've got a plant, you've got a cat, you've got a human being. You've got different entities. And the difference is, the rock is not animated, the plant is animated. It's got the power of growth and nutrition. It's got a vegetative soul. Okay? Um, for one to perceive and growing plants, a certain power of life without a share in sense of perception. There's another form of life besides this, which has both that one, and also has regulation by sense of perception, as in the nature of irrational animals. For well, not only are they nourished and grow, but they have the activity of sense perception and apprehension. So, you know, this is what we see in animals, it includes both levels before. The perfect embodied life is seen in the rational need of human nature, which is both nourished and endowed with sense perception and partakes of reason and is ordered by intellect. Okay? So, the three stages like that. Question number 12. If, therefore, scripture says that the human being came into being last after every animated being, the lawgiver is doing nothing other than teaching us matters regarding the soul, seeing that by a certain necessary sequence of order, the perfect comes last. The others are included in the rational also, while the sense perceptive is surely the vegetative form, and that in turn is contemplated in material beings. Thus, reasonably, nature makes the ascent, as it were, by steps, I mean from the lower to the more perfect really remarkable statement of the 4th century. Nature 
makes an ascent from the lower forms of life to the higher. Yeah? What you've got in Genesis 1, you have plants, you have animals, but there's a human being. Nature's making the ascent. Okay? Um, Talks about the interdependence of body and soul and body and mind. Just two more quotations, then we'll turn to chapter 16. Quotation of the 13 and 14. Since then, our nature has bestowed upon our molded figure a certain godlike grace. By implanting in the image the likeness of his own good gifts, for this reason he gave of his munificence the other good gifts to human nature. It is not strictly right to say that he gave of intellect and wisdom, but he gave a share of them adding to the image the proper adornment of his own nature. So the intellect is not simply the latest stage in growth. It's actually sharing in God. The power of intellect. And he says, Christians 14 then, since then the intellect is a thing intelligible and corporeal, its grace would have been incommunicable and isolated without its movement being manifest by some contrivance. For this reason, there was need of this instrumental formation that by touching that reflection of the vocal organs, it might indicate by the quality of the sound struck the movement within. So we grow by sense perception, but it's through sense perception, by being able to talk and be able to hear, that our mind actually grows. So our mind is completely dependent upon the body. It only grows by, by bodily sensations. Okay? So this really, you know, beautiful picture, I think, of the human being in the image of God. Okay? First 15 chapters. In chapter 16, he says, okay, just let me finish this. So we've got to go back to first principles. We've got to go back to the scripture. Let's go back to the scripture first. God says, the human being was made in the image of God. And then he says, well, look around you. Where do you see that? When you look around you, what you see are miserable, suffering people, falling sick and dying. How can you possibly say that they're in the image of the immortal and incorruptible God? Yeah, I've never seen any other writer, really, throughout history, addressing that incongruity. Scripture says this, but what we see is this. Scripture doesn't lie, but neither does our own eyesight. Yeah? So how are you going to hold them together? Okay. Challenge. So he goes back to Genesis, the, the starting point, the text in Genesis, and now he notices or adds something different from that verse. So condition number 15. God created the human in his own image, in the image of God created him. He okay, could have done that. Male and female created him then. He said nothing about male and female so far, just be the human in the image of God. Male and female created him then. Oh, now we've got something added to the image. You know, literally another clause in the verse. You know. But then it stands at odds with what Paul says. Because Paul says in Christ is neither male nor female. So if Christ is the archetype, of human beings to come to be like Christ, and we're made in the image, what then is male and female? So have we got a point of divergence going on in that? And might that account for why we don't see the human, the image of God when we look around us now? Okay? He gets into all sorts of complicated things with regard to that, and it's made worse by the fact that he says, I'm not going to tell you what I think about this. I'm going to imagine all sorts of scenarios for you to exercise upon. Okay? By the time you've gone through all of those and you've had your mind purified through going through all the exercises, he then comes to the point, Genesis, he, 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 he you know, gets all sorts of exercises back saying, well, had, perhaps had there been no sin, we would have multiplied that to angels, neither male nor female, but angels multiplied. Just all that kind of thing. But having done all that, he then comes back and says, okay, now I'll tell you what's going on. And he then points out, Genesis 1.28, where it says, God bless them and said, increase and multiply, is only said after they could be divided into male and female. So there never was a way of multiplying apart from through male and female. It could be plain if you do that one, okay? Purify your fault. It's a key, key fault. Um, but the other thing he then does, to, to, to bear that in mind, I'm not going to talk more about that male and female, we'll talk about it, questions and answers, if I don't talk too long, but I'm going to carry on. But the other thing he says, go to question number 16. We need to go through these, these quite quickly now. He says, so having addressed the question in chapter 16, towards the end of 16, 16.12, you know, why is it we don't see um, the image of God when we look around us? 
He says, now as the image bears in all points the stamp of the prototypical beauty, if it did not have a difference in some respect, it would be assuredly no longer be a likeness, but without any divergence in any point, it would show to be identical to it in every way. So there must be a difference between image and prototype. What difference then do we discern between the divine itself and that which is likely to the divine? We find it in the fact that one exists uncreatively, the other subsists through creation. And the difference of this property introduces a further sequence of other properties. For it's certainly and universally confess that the uncreated nature is immutable and is always as it is. While the created nature cannot subsist without alteration, for its very passage from non-being to being is a kind of movement and alteration of the non-existent being changed by divine purpose into being. So the very fact that we come into existence means we've got movement. Yeah? And it's this movement which differentiates us from the uncreated. And ultimately, it's this movement which is a capacity of going in strength, yeah, in movement. And that's where you get the idea of a strain cause needing to be persuaded by, by um, reason. So the whole thing now becomes a bit more in terms of movement. But even more than that, <coughs> he then turns around and says, well, actually, the human being made in the image of God is a totality of all human beings from beginning to end. Yeah, it's not one particular human being. After all, Adam's not even mentioned. Adam's only mentioned in Genesis 2, not Genesis 1. So we're not talking about one particular human being. We're talking about the whole of humanity. So quotation number 11. So 17, 17 and 18. 17 and 18. What is it then that we think concerning these matters? When the account says that God made the human being, all humankind, is indi indicated by the indefinite character of the term. For the creature was not here also called Adam, that's Genesis 2, the narrative that follows, relates. But the name given for the created human is not the particular Adam, but the universal. Thus we are led by the universal name of the nature to suppose something such as this, that by divine foreknowledge and power, all humanity is included in the first formation. For it is fitting for God not to think of any of the things that has come to be by him as indeterminate, but that for each being there should be some limit and measure marked out by the wisdom of the maker. Now, it might strike us as well to think there's you know, a fixed number of human beings. You know, we kind of think that way these days. You know, time's going to carry on, we're going to multiply, whatever, fill the other, all the rest of it. You know? But his point would be, you know, the world will come to an end. That's a given. But if the world will come to an end, that means there's a fixed number. Simple as that. There's a fixed number. And only if there's a fixed number will there be a particular shape. If there's an infinite number, it just carries on and it's shapeless. So only a fixed number of human beings is the entire pleroma of humanity from beginning to end forming the one human being. So quotation number 18. Again, it's chapter 16. Now just as any particular human being is encompassed by its bodily dimensions, and his magnitude, commensurate with the appearance of his body, is a measure of his subsistence. You know, every particular human being got a particular shape. It's finite. Yeah, otherwise, it would have no shape. So also, I think, that the entire plenitude, the entire fullness of humanity, was included by the God of all, by the power of foreknowledge, as in one body. And that this is what the account teaches, saying, God made a human being in accordance with the image of God made the earth. The human being manifested together with the first formation of the world. Notice that the verse manifested. The human being manifested together with the first formation of the world, and he who shall come to be after the consummation of the world, that's so manifested and actually coming to be at the end, comes to be at the end. Both likewise have this, they equally bear themselves a divine image. For this reason, the whole was called one human being, because to the power of God, nothing is either past or is to come, but even that which is looked for is embraced equally with the present by his all embracing activity. The whole nature then, extending the first to the last, is a kind of single image of who he is. The whole of humanity from beginning to end, in all its particulars, together, form the one human being that's an image of, that is the image of God. It's just mind blown to think like that. Um, von Bauer says, our summarizing, the total Christ, 
is none other than the total humanity. Yeah. And in some ways it goes back to what we talked about earlier, the movement from Adam to Christ, the scriptural movement from Adam to Christ, is a movement of Adam across time, constantly being formed, but seen from the point of view of the end, the whole Adam now is the whole Christ. First Adam, last Adam, man from earth, man from heaven. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll read quickly through 20, 21, 22, and then we can turn to the third part of the work. So, 20. With a plenitude of human beings and preconceived by the activity of foreknowledge coming into light by means of this more animal form of birth. So, the point about being male and female is not simply, you know, to have sexual pleasure, to be able to reproduce in order to um, preserve one's family or one's name or provide security in old age. The point, and that's why you have to purify your minds, the point of reproduction is to actually build up the body of Christ. If it's going to be the entire pleroba of humanity from beginning to end, then sexual reproduction actually is building up the body of Christ. It's got a divine function, not simply a whatever, you know, preserving human life or whatever it might be. Building up the body of beginning and end. And that's also the reason why we can't see the, the age of God in the present, because the fullness of numbers is not there yet. Okay, um, God who guides all things in a certain order and sequence, sees the inclination of our nature to what is lonely, which he beholds equally the present what is to be for what happens. He made this form of birth absolutely necessary for human beings. Therefore also knew that time, for the that time coextensive with the formation of human beings. So the extent of time should be adapted for the entrance of the predetermined souls, and that the flowing movement of time shall then hop when humanity is no longer produced by it. And when the genesis of human beings is completed, time should stop together with the end of it. Then should take place a reconstitution of all, and with the changing of the whole, humanity should be changed from corruptible and wealthy to the impassable and incorruptible. Okay? And that's what Paul is talking about. Quotation number 21, when he talks about, Behold, I tell you a great mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Time is coextensive with the production of the human race, with the production of the human being in the image. It requires time. Uh, quotation number 22, we'll skip over 21, the sake of time. Sake of time, here we go. Uh, Therefore, let him awake the time necessarily coextensive with human beings. For even the patriarch of Abraham, while they had the desire to see the good things, did not seek seeking the heavenly homeland, the apostle says, nevertheless, are still in the state of hoping for that grace. God having foreseen something better for us, according to Singapore, that without us they would not be made perfect. Okay, so that's chapter 16 to 29. That's his second part of the book. Chapter 13, so the last part is going to be chapter 30, it's the longest chapter. But in chapter 30, he does what, what Timaeus does, and he goes to the actual formation of a particular human being. So quotation number 23, 24, and 25. He says, just as a body proceeds from a very small original state to a perfect state, so also the activity of soul growing in step with the subject gains and increases with it. So, now, a seed is deposited in the womb. It grows by the power of growth and nutrition. When its body of soul has reached a certain size, stature, it's ready to come out into the world of sense perception. So uh, it, on, it grows increases with it. For in its first formation, first of all comes the power of growth and nutrition, nourishment alone. And so there's a root buried in the ground. For the smallest of the one receiving does not admit of more. Then as a plant comes to light and shows its shoot to the sun, the gift of sense perception blossoms. And when at last it is ripened and has grown up to its proper height, the rational factor begins to shine, just like some fruit, not appearing all at once, but by diligence, growing with perfected instrument, always bearing as much fruit as the power of the subject grants. And then carries on about the relationship between body and soul, where the one comes first or the other. Creation number 24, he then adds, after a long detour, he says, the purpose was to show that the seminal cause of our constitution is neither a soul without a body nor a body without a soul, but that from animated living bodies, a being living and animated from the first is generated. Human nature receiving it to be cherished like a nursling with their own powers. It is nourished in both 
respects and makes its growth manifest appropriately in each part. For it immediately displayed by this artistic and scientific process of formation, the power of the soul interwoven with it, appearing at first somewhat obscurely, but afterwards increasingly invades the currently grown with the perfection of organism. He's simply describing the, the lifespan of a human being, seen in the womb, grown by the power of growth and nutrition, coming out into the world of the perception, continuing to grow in body and soul, and extending throughout the whole course of that life. <coughs> and then finally from this work, he says, we say that the all contriving nature, again, nature's the active one in this, all contriving nature, taking from the kindred matter within herself the part that comes from the human being, crafts the statue. Just as form follows on the gradual work of the stone, the first somewhat indistinct but more perfect after, the completion of the work, so in the carving of the organism, the form of the soul, by the analogy, by the carving of the organism, the form of the soul, by the analogy, is displayed in the substratum. Incomplete in that which is incomplete, perfect in that which is perfect, but it would have been perfect from the beginning had not nature been maimed by evil. For this reason, our sharing that impassioned animal like Genesis brings it about that the divine image does not shine forth immediately in the molded figure, but by a certain method and sequence through those material and more animal like properties of the soul, brings to perfection the human being. So the human being is seed deposited in the womb, growing in the womb, power of growth and nutrition, coming out into the world of sense perception, continuing to grow in the world of sense perception, a life and growth which culminates in death. And death becomes a birth into life. You can see that just one second, I'm going to finish, put my hand in the time, I'm going to finish quite quickly. Um, birth into life. And so he ends the work by exhorting us to put off the old man, put on the new. And that's where he finishes the work. But quite what is meant by that is shown in the work where the next three quotations come from, those who have fallen asleep. The work of encouragement to, to uh, those with. Uh, uh, who are suffering from bereavement, and those who lament the fact that others have died. Okay. So he's now dealing with the final stage, the, the death that enters into the Paschal mystery, life through death. He says, in just the same way, those who are displeased by the change from the present life seem to me to be experience a suffering of embryos by wanting to live their lives at all times in this place of material odiousness. For the, since the birth pangs of death serve as a midwife assisting the birth of human beings to another life, when they go forth to that life and join the pure spirit, they know by experience what a great difference is between life and the present one. Well, those left behind in this moist and flabby life, since they are simply embryos and not humans, call the departing one before them God has a departure before them from the affliction that sounds us unhappy, as though he were leaving some good. They do not know that just as the newborn infant eyes open for him when he leaves what now afflicts him. So we are not yet human, we are embryos. This world is but a womb in which we continue to grow. We grew by the power of growth and nutrition, the vegetable soul in the maternal womb. We now grow in this world, which the Paul puts it is laboring in travail for waking the sons of the revelation of the sons of God. We're growing in this world, the world of sense perception, until we are finally ready to no longer be embryos in this womb, but to finally become humans in Christ. Okay. Um, so, is it 27? Nature always trained us by death, and death has been made to grow together with life as it passes through time. For since life has always moved from the past to the future, never does away with what follows afterwards, Death is always what accompanies a life-giving activity by being united with it. For in past times, every life-giving movement and activity certainly ceases. Since then, <coughs> impotence and activity are the special property of death, and certainly this always follows after the life-giving activity. It's not outside the truth to say that death has been woven together with life. That is why in the words of the great Paul, we die daily. Not remaining constantly the same in the same house of the body, but from time to time we become different at something else by addition or subtraction being constantly changed as though to a new body. Why then are we astonished at death when the life existing through the flesh has been demonstrated to be its constant care and training ground? So we're always learning by death through this life so that we can finally be born through our death into 
life, a language can't be touched by death, we went into it through death. Finally be born into life. Okay? And I want to finally point with regard to that in that Paschal transition where Paul says we must all be changed. We must take that really seriously. All the analogies for the resurrection and transformation imply both continuity and discontinuity. A seed falling in the ground becoming a plant. It's continuous, but it's discontinuous. So, quotation number 28, Gregory says, about Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, we are a house not made by hands, eternal in the heaven. He says, let no one describe to me the mark, shape, and form of that house not made by hands according to the light according to the likeness of the characteristic marks that now appear to us, and that distinguish us from one another by special properties. So our bodily properties are not going to be what distinguish us in the resurrection. For since it is not only the resurrection that has been preached to us by the divine oracles, but also those who are being renewed by the resurrection placed by the divine scriptures must be changed. Since that the case, it's entirely necessary that what we should be changed to is being hidden by absolutely everyone and is unknown, because no example of what is hoped is to be seen in the life we now live. Yeah, you know, a seed doesn't see what the plant will look like. Okay, just two final questions. One to show that what Greg is doing is continued in the tradition thereafter. This quotation from Maximus, okay, quotation number 29, Maximus, uh, 7th century. Uh, great theological writer. He says, For it is true, although it may be a jarring and unusual thing to say, that both we and the Word of God, the Creator and Master of the universe, we exist in a kind of womb owing to the present conditions of our life. In this sense perceptible world, just as if you were enclosed in a womb, the Word of God appears only obscurely and only to those who have the spirit of John the Baptist. Well, on the other hand, human beings gazing through the womb of the material world catch but a glimpse of the world that's concealed within beings. And this, again, only if they're endowed with John's spiritual gift. For when compared to the ineffable glory and the splendor of the age to come, and to the kind of life that awaits us there, this present life differs in no way from the womb swathed in darkness in which, for the sake of us who were infantile in mind, the infinitely perfect word of God who loves mankind became an infant. Really quite beautiful. We're in a womb, the world comes to us as a child, for us who are infantile, so that we might grow in the womb to follow him thereafter. And then finally, Dostoevsky, we are clearly transitory beings, and our existence on earth is clearly a process, the uninterrupted existence of a Christmas transition into the world. So that what really, if I'm right, that Gregory is reworking the Timaeus in the way that I've tried to show it in all of this, what really strikes me most dramatically, and this is based really upon that, that way of feeling scripture that's talking about, from Adam to Christ, Christ not being what you see in the New Testament, but Christ being the end of the narrative, the passion unfolding the scripture, resulting in the proclamation of the New Testament, is moving from Antichrist to the movement of growth. It's moving from type to reality. It's a movement from breath to spirit. All the things that we looked at. But for Gregory, it's the movement of the ascent of nature from the lower forms of life to the higher. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a movement that nature itself is making through this evolutionary process not Darwin and whatever else, but you know, it's, it's moving up steps of, steps of time. It's a movement which is a movement of nature from beginning to end. It's a movement of scripture from Adam to Christ. And both of those are recapitulated in each of our own lives from conception, growth of the womb, growth, growth in this womb to finally be part of that totality of humanity that together constitutes a the, the body of Christ. It's the movement, our movement from Adam to Christ. And actually, I think, in a real sense, all these three movements are the same movement, recapitulated in one another, mm -hmm. which I find totally mind blowing. And I'm leaving it across the world, so I should probably stop at that. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Father John. You've given us uh, more than enough provocations, and um, I'm sure now in Texas we're all wishing we had a little more moist nature, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, to help us continue on in this conversation, um, we've invited, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Natalie Carnes and Dr. Thomas Breedlove to give some prepared remarks. Uh, we'll also uh, have time afterwards for some general Q&A, uh, and so be uh, thinking of things as, uh, as we go along. Uh, Dr. Carnes is Professor of Theology here in the Religion Department at Baylor. She's a constructive theologian who draws on traditional themes in Christian theology to speak to the complexities of modern life. She's the author of several books and articles on the role of literary and visual uh, art in theology, as well as the intersection of theology and feminism and gender studies. She's written on the role of images in theological discourse in her book, Image and Presence, a Christological reflection on iconoclasm and iconophilia. And she's riffed on Augustine's confessions in the writing of her most recent book, Motherhood, a Confession, but before all that, to read the, the end from the beginning, uh, her first book was on the role of aesthetics in Gregory of Nyssa, a wonderful book called Beauty, a Theological Engagement with Gregory of Nyssa. So I'll invite her up, and then afterwards, we'll hear from Dr. Thomas Breedlove, who's a postdoctoral researcher at Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion, who's also spent a fair bit of time with Gregory. Dr. Breedlove is currently preparing a manuscript on Gregory of Nyssa that brings Gregory into dialogue with contemporary French phenomenology, um, particularly the writers Michel Henri, Jean-Louis Chrétien, and Maurice Marleau-Ponty, to explore questions of theological anthropology. In addition, Dr. Breedlove's writing extends to a variety of topics in theology and theology and the arts, um, he's published on Eugene Bonalaskin's Laurus, uh, The Spirituals of Roland Hayes, The Poetry of John Donne, and he's even presented papers once or twice on dog-headed saints, the Cenocephalus, a topic you can ask him about uh, sometime later. Uh, but much of his Research and thinking orbits around themes in theological anthropology, especially the relationship between human finitude and transcendence, between divine imaging and human creatureliness. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Collins first. Thank you, Alex, and to the ISR more broadly, and. Um, the Wesley House, Truett. Um, that's really stimulating. You've, you've got to admire a speaker who comes to a Baptist seminary and starts off his talk telling them that the Bible is the problem with theology. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you patristics is boring. Um, you've all been sitting for a long time. I wonder if you want to take a second and stand and stretch. Um, but we've got more to go here, so um, gotta keep your head in the game. And I'll just say while you're stretching, I, I'm just still thinking about um, what you were saying, Father Bear, about the, uh, the kind of let it be in creation and the way that it transitions to the subjunctive of let us make, which invites our own response of let it be. And how that's, um, how that's completed in Mary. Um, Mary is the one who says let it be. And in that way, there's this interesting Luke in parallel to the Johannine consummation of creation on the cross. Um, it's just a really beautiful thought. That's not what I'm here to talk about, though. Um, I, I came to Father John Bear's interpretation of Gregory of Nyssa with a theological question about predation and death that I was hoping that Nissen and Father Bear could together help me to answer. So both Thomas and I got, um, got his book, which is amazing and excellent, and um, Alex has a copy if you want to see it. And we were able to read it, and so that's what our, where our responses are coming from. They're coming from reading this book and responding to that. Uh, but instead of answering my question about predation and death, um, Nissen and Father Bear together, they flipped my difficulty upside down. 
And, and maybe you'll see how, because you have now heard Father Bear's talk, so you are hearing my journey in light of the end. So you're, 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 you can practice the hermeneutic that Father Bear's been commending to us of reading the text in light of the end. You know where this is going. The problem about predation that I wanted to pursue presses what I think is a serious theological conundrum of our time, which I call the cute cat problem. So the problem is this. My cat, Julian, is a really cute cat. And he's not like especially cute, but he's cute in the way that like all cats are cute. So he can be lazily relaxing on the couch and then suddenly pounce on a sunbeam. If we open our front door for longer than 0.5 seconds, he'll rocket out towards the open air. And he can hop on our counters with this amazing agility, which is not so cute to my husband. But the problem is, for me, that this quickness, this playfulness, this agility, this grace, they're all adaptations from my cat's evolutionary history as a predator. In other words, it's not that Julian is cute and also that he kills. It's that the very things that make him cute are the things that enable him to kill. That they're even produced by his evolutionary history as a killer. So what does it mean that the very essence of Julian, his, his cute catness, or if you prefer Thomas Aquinas' language, his perfection as a cat, is bound to predation and death? So to lay out the theological stakes here, death and predation precede human agency, and so any fall, shaping the creatures of our world. Animating my cat's playfulness is not only a good creator, but the horrific fact of a world where life feeds on death. Do I praise God for the way Julian pounces on sunbeams, or see in this act the corruption of sin? So I'm not the first to grapple with this problem. And I, as I see it, there's about three popular ways that theologians have responded to this problem of death preceding human agency. So one is to appeal to an angelic fall. And on this view, we have death and predation because they were introduced by angels falling in a way that precedes all earthly creatureliness. This has the benefit of tying the fall, tying death to a fall, and so answering to our intuition that death is not good. Yet it has the drawback of framing humans as entering a rigged world, where our sin is less original and our culpability for it perhaps attenuated. Another is the evolutionary theodicy approach, which acknowledges the way death is woven into the order of things, affirming death is terrible, but disentangling it from the fall in a way that helps make sense of our evolutionary history. This approach claims that there was simply no other way for God to create a world with the beauty and diversity of ours than by predation, struggle, suffering, death. In this view, Darwin shows us both the will of God and the constraints on God. Finally, the ecological approach is similar to evolutionary theodicy in acknowledging the centrality of death, but instead of framing death as a bad effect of the evolutionary process constraining God, this approach reframes death more neutrally as part of the balance of the ecological order of things. As our friend Thomas, Aquinas, not Breedlove, puts it, God allows defects in some particular things so that the complete good of the universe may not be impeded. There would be no life for the lion, were there no animals for its prey. So God is left off the hook, but only by converting death into a non-problem, or at least minimizing the horror I feel that death drives the universe. So, in light of how unsatisfying I find these ways of describing the place of death, I wondered about the possibility seated in Gregory's double creation account, in which an ideal creation first exists in the mind of God, and then God, for knowing our sin, creates sex bodies that procreate and replenish the human race in the face of death. Maybe, I thought, there was some underappreciated resources here in Gregory for facing the horror of the world. So imagine my dismay to find Father Bear insisting again and again that there is no actual double creation in Gregory and that Gregory is not really bothered by an account of the fall that requires contrasting pre-lapsarian and post-lapsarian existence. So what can, we, what can Gregory tell us about death and predation? While death may be my constant preoccupation these days, it's not Gregory's. Or at least fatality isn't Gregory's. 
The human creature for Gregory, and the stream of interpretation that Gregory speaks into, is one of constant growth. So you've seen some of these quotations. The Father Bear tells us that Irenaeus describes the human as requiring change, growth, and time to be able to share in God's uncreated life. And that Maximus even describes the world of sense perception as a kind of womb where humans learn to discern true good from its appearance. I was struck reading Father Bear's interpretation to his new translation how Gregory so often, when death appears, figures death as a kind of birth. We are, Gregory insists, born through death. You have some of these quotations on your handout where Father Bear quotes Gregory describing the birth pangs of death serving as the midwife assisting the birth of humans to another life. And those who have not yet died, who are left behind in the moist and flabby life, I know you remember that phrase, are simply embryos and not humans. Death is a passage from the womb of this life into a more fully human life in the next. So death then takes on the significance, not just as fatality, but a site of natality as well. This is what I meant by Father Bear in this and turning my predicament on its head. Where I lament fatality, they see natality. But there's more. Not only does death figure a passage of natality for individual living, for an individual's living toward the hope of the resurrection, death is the very means by which humanity grows. It is not separate from how we lay hold of the image of God found in the archetype that is Christ. Bear quotes Gregory saying, Nature always trains us by death, and death has been made to grow together with life as it passes through time. Why, he asks, are we astonished at death when the life existing through the flesh has been demonstrated to be its constant care and its training ground? As Father Bear writes, death for Gregory is the means by which God maintains human autonomy while also ensuring that evil would in due course pass away. I think of this striking image and on the soul in the resurrection in which death is the occasion for scraping the sin barnacles off the soul. Death is woven into human nature for Gregory like a gift, a means of our redemption. It is, in a way, good. And yet, it is not good in itself. It is only good because death has been converted by the resurrection to a site of mutality. As Father Bear so beautifully sums up these themes, Gregory's understanding of the economy of creation is thoroughly teleological, based on the pattern of growth that we see in the case of each human being, which is bound up with the dynamics of the cosmos. The teleology is eschatological, the coming to be of the entire plenitude of human beings that is the total Christ, the human being, the very image of God, something achieved through the conversion of death. I realized as I read Father Bear's book that this theology of death, of teleological growth, of natality, gives me something that I was hoping the double creation might give me. Death is both the means of our redemption and that which is redeemed. Death is a gift for us sin-prone and eventually God-imaging mortals to return to God. In a way, Gregory's position is closest to the ecological theologians, who see death as an important part of the balance in life of an ecological system. Ecologists realize that the death of organisms is everywhere a gift to the life of other organisms, first and foremost in our very soil. And yet, Gregory also gives me a way to hold on to at least some part of my intuition that this reality is a horrifying one. For without the transformation of the resurrection, death cannot be a site of natality for any individual creature, even if it is a site of natality for creaturely life as such. It cannot touch the horrifying realization, in other words, that I will die. Gregory's dual affirmation that death is a gift and that death must be converted both acknowledge and transform my horror, at least potentially. Moreover, his approach avoids sacralizing death, a worry feminist theologians sometimes express about atonement theologies that seem to veer towards necrophilia. For Gregory's center is not fatality, but natality in his theology of death. By framing anthropology natally, Gregory can affirm that creation is good, the body is good, death is good, and God is good. I was struck reading Father Bear's translation how the metaphor Gregory invokes to describe God remaking death is often God the artisan, the maker, the artist. 
And so he provides a picture of art that suggests a whole other path we could begin to think through with Father Bear and Gregory. Where so many artists and philosophers have proclaimed death to be the central human preoccupation, have claimed death as exerting an almost gravitational pull on all our makings and musings, God, the artist who sculpts and makes humanity, wielding death as an instrument for new life, suggests a different picture of art. An affirmation of making towards birth that is so powerful, death can only serve birth's centrality as its passage or its midwife. Thanks. Thank you to both of you and to our sponsors and our host here. I confess that I'm one of those who has spent many hours. Um, almost certainly too many hours wrestling with this text of Gregory's for answers to questions about the fall and its effects on human life and human nature. Let me get, begin then by emphasizing the relief uh, brought to me by Father Bear's illuminating, illumination of why those answers have eluded us. This is because, Father Bear states quite simply, Gregory has not been speaking of Adam. He has been speaking of Christ, if you know what it means to be human, look to Christ. As Father Bear notes, this is the center of Gregory's anthropology. Being human is nothing other than being the image of God. With my time today, I want to consider what it means to receive our human nature from Christ and how such a reception might shape our accounts of the world, humans, and God. All this very briefly, of course. Father Bear's work helps reveal two pictures of the human creature in Gregory, I think. One of which finds both God and the human, in some sense, by turning away from the world, while the other names the world as precisely where we can encounter God. What I want to propose in the end is that the presence of both these pictures in Gregory might press us to a different conception of human creatureliness altogether. God's transcendent difference from the world is a fundamental theme of Gregory's theology. Apophatic litanies appear throughout his writing. God is, in contrast to creation, impassable, immortal, immutable, immaterial. Alongside these negations, we find affirmations equally, if paradoxically so, apophatic. God is truth, the good, existence itself. The path to truth, Gregory writes, lies in learning to distinguish the God who is from the world that only appears to be. In the ascetic writings, failing to distinguish appearance from reality appears again as the root of sin. Confusing the transient for the permanent, we see permanence in and through the world, deluded into believing that those things, quote, naturally subject to flux and transient, are in fact truly existing. Gregory's homilies on the Song of Songs condemn the vanity of those who seek permanence in the fantasies of earthly success and us so many great litanies of these things. Dream images of high offices, treasures, lordship, self-conceit, bewitching pleasures, lust, fame, luxury. Given this radical transcendence, though, can the relation between the creature and God still be positive? For Gregory, yes, and this for two reasons. On a general level, the denial of any subsistent autonomous existence in creation means that creation, precisely to the extent that it exists, exists only by sharing in or participating in divine life. More particularly, for humans, the relation to God's life is more profound, for we can share not only in the bare fact of life, but in the character of God's life, which is inseparable in Gregory's understanding from God's goodness. Thus, the distinction between divine permanence and the world's transience, which lies at the root of human waywardness, concerns not only the proper recognition of God, but also the proper recognition of who and what human creatures are. To recognize who God is is not to know something, but to be something, to act virtuously, which is why I think I might add parenthetically, the divine image in Gregory is never reducible to a faculty or an ontology. Um, rationality is essential to, but not sufficient for divine imaging, which is a matter of virtue. The one who is pure, Gregory writes, quote, by looking at his own purity, perceives the archetype in the copy. 
What does all this mean for questions of how we might understand human nature and how we might think of where one encounters God? Two brief remarks here. The first is that creaturely life in this trajectory in Gregory's thought is inseparable from divine life. Human life cannot explain itself precisely because the very fact of its life reveals its derivation from divine life. Turning away from the world and its false definitions, I discover I am not the author of my life. I live a life that has originated elsewhere, which has been given to me. Most fundamentally, I am a me rather than an I. I am alive only by participating in, being given, God's life. Michel Henry, a philosopher on whom Father Bear has written, puts it this way. Life has the same meaning for God, for Christ, and for man. This is so because there is but a single and self-same essence of life, and more radically, a single and self-same life. In Gregory's words, not to be in God is not to be at all. The second remark can be summarized in a comment from Father Bear, offered in a reflection on Henri in his book on John's Gospel. Flying in the face of science and philosophy, and indeed common sense, and despite all appearances, Christianity asserts that human beings are not beings of the world. For Henri, and for Gregory too, idolatry looks for the essential truth of human nature in the world. Idolatry seeks to control and own life by way of knowledge, power, wealth pleasure. What is seen, Gregory writes, is transitory, whereas what is invisible is eternal. Attached to all that does not last, that is appearance only rather than substance, we forget who God is, and we also forget who we are. The world, because it cannot reveal who God is, also cannot reveal who we are. But if the world is powerless, to offer us this revelation, if in fact looking into the world only hides the truth of human nature, what does it mean to think of this picture of human nature as Christological? If we find our nature by looking toward Christ, does this mean that we should look to the incarnation, to Christ's birth, from Mary, his life and years of teaching, his death on the cross? On these topics, Gregory's text remains almost completely silent. Insofar as the truth of human nature is known in the life derived from God's own life, insofar as the world is the realm of appearance rather than truth, the turn from the world is perhaps a turn from what we commonly think of as the incarnation. But what then should we make of another thread in Gregory's writing, one woven throughout the moments surprisingly frequent when he directs our attention precisely to our bodies and the bodies of others, to the materiality of our flesh which is born, suffers, and dies. In these passages, the antidote to our entanglement with the world, with the duplicity and transience of a world in which we have searched for stability only found in God, is not to distinguish who we really are from the world, but to recognize our own finitude. In his sermons on Beatitudes, Gregory promises his listeners, I will show you as in a mirror who you are and what you are. The mirror he holds up rhetorically is the graveyard. Have you not seen the burial ground the mysteries of our existence, the heap of bones piled on each other, skulls stripped of flesh, staring fearsome and horrible from empty eye sockets? If you have seen those things, then in them you have observed yourself. Even more, if we should recognize our true nature in the graveyard, we should also recognize it in the bodies of those who suffer. Gregory condemns our proclivity to treat those who suffer as something other than human, rather than as the best picture of what it truly means to be human. Those who refuse charity do so out of a resistance to recognizing their own finitude in those who suffer, out of a false control of their own permanence. These passages expand the problem of human way waywardness. It is not only as we have already seen that we seek permanence in the transient world and fail to appreciate divine permanence. Sin arises in our denial of our own finitude, our material flesh. To deny the flesh is to fail to recognize ourselves. But even more, in certain passages in Gregory, this denial blinds us to God. It is no accident that Matthew's parable of the least of these, where Christ identifies with the poor and hungry and sick and imprisoned, lies in the background 
of Gregory's famine sermons, where he offers that insistence that we recognize those ourselves and those who suffer. Given God's transcendence, it is only because God joined with flesh that we encounter God. We reach up, quote, to the incomprehensible and the infinite, Gregory writes in the homilies on Sign of Songs, only by first laying hands on what has been made visible, which is the nature of the flesh. I find it difficult to synthesize these two trajectories into a single picture of the human creature. Yet this difficulty, it strikes me, and this is one thing I think I've slowly learned uh, through the slowness of my ability from Father Bear, is not slowness of my intellect. <laughs> uh, is to give you an example there. <laughs> All right, here we go again. Um, I find it difficult to synthesize these things. Yet this difficulty, it strikes me, is not a limitation in Gregory's thought, but one of its more profound truths. Perhaps nothing, neither alone, is sufficient. Michel Henry, whom I've already invoked, offers a brilliant, a dazzling picture of the first account. A radical reading of the relation between my life and God's life that defines me in my essence as inseparable from God. As God, if we're going to continue to be provocative here. Yet for Henri, this emphasis is complicated, complicated by a consequent denial of the language of creatureliness and divine imaging, and in his articulation of divine life as the absolute truth of human nature, complicated by a rejection of the world's capacity to mediate and bear divine presence. On the other hand, surely the insistence is correct. If we see only the world, we risk not only confusing the world for God, but also forgetting who we are. Perhaps as a concluding word, the creature's resistance to singular, stable definition, our failure to know ourselves absolutely, might well simply attest how relation to God constitutes who we are. As Gregory himself puts it, in our inability to grasp the nature of our, own, of our mind and its relation to our body, we find, quote, an accurate likeness to the transcendent one, figuring by our own unknowability the incomprehensible nature. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you to you both. Uh, we do have some time for questions. So there's a microphone over here. If folks want to make their way over there, and just feel free to just get up and speak. Uh, but Father Bear, in the meantime, as people are making their way, I wonder if you have any thoughts you want to, to give in response to what we just did. Um, real appreciation for both of your comments, papers, thoughts, reflections. Um, the question of death is so fascinating, really fascinating. And it's one which I think is probably one of our most important topics for me, because we really have lost sight of death. Yeah? And the whole liturgy that would typically go with death, which would have been just pervasive and common, would have seen in every part of human existence from the beginning of the world until the early mid 20th century. Yeah? Um, I actually think it's one of our biggest problems, along with the fact that we've got a book called the Bible. And it's really, really the desacralization of the ends of life leads to the chemonization of life. Mm -hmm. yeah, just, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and then uh, the questions you were posing about bear being flesh and on the, I mean, I can do a lot more, but we have to be to a place and think about this. But I would think about it as well. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for your talk. That was very insightful. Um, I've been dabbling a little bit in trying to understand uh, theological anthropology. Um, my question is related to your view versus uh, Balthazar. And so it's how would you respond to the Balthazarian view of theodrama, which makes incarnation and the crucifixion as the midpoint in the theodramatic acts of creation, redemption, and consummation? Because it's got a whole lot of other things that are going on with it in a way that is not 
that actually comes out of having the book as a Bible. Incarnation, 30 years later, crucifixion. Yeah. Have you read Athanasius' work on the incarnation? I very much want to. One of the things that's really pushed me to think about all of this, Athanasius, the great Athanasius, went to work on the incarnation, and he doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus from there. He talks about how the one on the cross is the word of God, and therefore the Christian faith is not our word. Yeah. So something else, radically else, is going on with that. What we've done when we talk about incarnation is we kind of combine John 1.14, which doesn't speak about birth, with the infancy narratives that don't talk about the word of God. Yeah? A whole lot of things, and that's why I try to put them John, just to get what's going on with all of that. Yeah? Um, now, with regard to the question about uh, midpoint eschatology, relation to and so on, I actually really like Peter like the big parts work in Revelation, and I think it's the best way of reading John and Revelation together as a twofold royal romance. Yeah? With the Gospel of John starting off with a wedding, but Christ telling the woman, now's not my time. The Revelation of the bridegroom across the Gospel of John, the bridegroom presented upon the cross. Mary approaches a garden like Eve would have done to Adam, but don't touch me yet. And in preparation of the bride across the book of Revelation uh, to end with the eschatological marriage. That's how we do. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, my question, first of all, I, I want to say I loved, like, I, I loved it. So this is great. But so there's a butt coming out. I know, there's a butt. And I feel bad that like, my one thing that I have to say to the microphone of everyone is my, my one butt. Uh, however, um, my, my only qualm uh, or, or maybe concern um, is that the work that Gregory is proposing comes across as quite anthropocentric. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. But that's what it is. Yes, uh, and so it seems as if kind of like the beautiful aspects of creation exist simply for humanity's enjoyment, such that like non-human uh, aspects of creation have their telos in, in humanity. That's what it, at least it sounds like, especially in like 2.2. Um, so my, my gut reaction is, is to kind of, uh, I don't know about it, how much I like that. Um, so I, I was curious if, if, if you have any insight on um, if that is a, a potentially a problem, if there might be something within Gregory's work that could uh, uh, overcome that anthropocentrism. No, uh, well, uh, mm, I want to qualify. I don't think it is anthropocentrism. Okay. Because I think what you're expecting of Gregory is a kind of way of approaching theology which he wasn't doing. In the sense of what you're looking for is a systematic account in which everything has its part. Yeah? Okay. But he's not doing that. He's writing the occasional pieces. So this is a rewriting of the Timaeus. He's got a rewriting of Friday. He's got a common, conjunct on and on and so They don't like systematic theology at that time. Yeah. You know? It's just straightforward. They don't. And really, you know, you've got a kind of movement in the earlier centuries, the Aramaic, Origin, Clan, and people like that. But their work is really exegetical expository. Not excuse that we know today, but with an Adam Christ typology, putting the scriptural mosaic together, all of that. Gregory's writing is a really remarkable time that didn't happen before, didn't happen after, where he's free with all that kind of basis of what Origin uh, uh, and Islamists have done. He got this wonderful Greek rhetorical, philosophical, literary education, and he's just adaptively using, creatively adapting all of those forms to this and filling a new content. Thereafter, for I don't know, 5th, 6th century onwards, Theology becomes much more concerned with specific points, you know, rightly treated on the Trinity of Irish, on you know, the Christology, on the Icons, whatever. And then ultimately, probably only in the second half of the second millennium, do you start writing systematics, which you're trying to give everything and make a coherent account of the whole and encapsulating everything into your fixed system. He's not doing that. Okay? So don't expect of him what he's not doing. Yeah? So in this way, he is writing a treatise for human beings. He's not writing for cats and dogs. Yeah? He's writing for human beings to explain to human beings about how to become human. Yeah? And he's describing all the things he's playing around with, lots of common topics. 
Kafka also felt free to stay in other places. <laughs> creation, new creation, I mean, a whole range of different things that you can say about all that, which I'm not doing again. Yeah? But then the other thing is, um, you know, from Michel and me, you know, Michel and me is very emphatic. You know, when we talk about life, I'm not going to tell you what it means to be a bumblebee. Yeah? You know, do we share life with bumblebees? But if you do that, you reduce life to the lowest common denominator. You know? What are some bumblebees are going to what, what, what you thought you were talking Bumblebees and snakes, snails, or whatever. Um, life becomes the lowest common denominator of what we all think we've got in common. Yeah? Whereas Christ says, I am the life. So life is more than what we think we've got in common with bumblebees. So we don't turn to bumblebees to try and understand what life is. More to the I can't possibly give an account of what it's like to be a dog. No, yeah, so all of those kind of, kind of considerations. But there's no doubt about it. Within his work, within all of their work, they talk about the whole of creation being the new, the new, the new creation, the old creation. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. So I wouldn't worry about questions down to the end of the century. Thank you. Well, Mary, let me uh, make a brief, just a brief comment and ask for your response. Um, it, uh, it's obvious that so much of the discussion of what it, what it is to be human from the, the father's point of view, uh, through your talk and through the commentary, is centered on the question of death, on, on the mystery of death. And in, in that, it seems to me that the, um, uh, there's something telling about the, the fact that the Christians, if, if did anything else, that they adopted much of what they inherited from the pre-Christian past from their pagan brothers and Christified it, if I may use that term. And one of them, there was a wonderful tradition. Can you just not talking to my friends? Is it making it difficult? Yeah, okay. I can hear you. I don't need it. It's about going on with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, and I'll repeat it, other people can't hear. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I can, I can show you very well. It's fair, yeah. But um, so, so, so in a way, Christians tended to adapt much of the literary tradition from their ancient sources. And one of them had to do with the consolation, consolation of death. The, 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 the pagans uh, had a very strong, through Seneca and Ovid, a very strong literary tradition and a philosophical tradition about death from Seneca. Yeah. Um, and much of it had to do with sort of reconciliation with the reality of death and the, the the need for a sort of piety, in a traditional sense, of respect for the dead, a, a, a mournful period, and then just get over it and know that death is just simply part of life. It's part of, it's part of the reality of the universe, and there's not much, much, much more we can do about it. So there's a wisdom gain in a, sort of, a certain resolution and acceptance. The Christians revolutionize, if nothing else, revolutionize that notion of death, so that now that there's, there's a sense of Yes, mourning is proper, but it's also, it's possible even to think of a time of death to celebrate, because what it does is then give, it, it shows that the human life is not over, and it has its chance now to, to even further develop, develop itself in the next. And that is with celebration in imitation of the resurrection and the life in, the life in heaven. So, I mean, that, what I want to say is, my, my comment is that you're hearing, hearing Gregory, and they're all specific writers, but we're also hearing the voice of the church. Gregory is not a unique I'm not speaker of this. And what's, what's wonderful about this, Cyril of Alexandria speaks, Gregory speaks, in the, in the same time, in the same period in the West, Paulinus of Nola, Ambrose, yeah. Jerome, they're all writing this yeah. sort of consolation literature. Yes. And so if you want to ever see the voice of the church and not the voice of individual self-promoting authors, you can probably find it in this theme. For sure. So I thought I would uh, well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's given me, I really appreciate this comments, and it's given me occasion for talking more. Because <laughs> 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 then there, there's some things that really do come out of it. So you're absolutely right. This is just simply, whether I'm talking about just simply common in the ancient church. They've got their distinctive ways of doing it, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth century Cappadocia, not second century France. Nobody mentioned one of the first Thessalonians, I think, chapter four. I mean, it's just right there, one line. Yeah, all of that, all of that. Um, one of the, one of the uh, texts which really sum it up most powerfully, and this is kind of that movement from fatality to natality, which we were talking about. 
there's a really beautiful way of putting mm -hmm. it. Um, and it really goes with that double way of reading scripture, reading it you know, along this kind of level, and then reading it in the light of the above, and, and the two, two things. It's a text from John of Damascus. We still use it in our uh, rock works funeral service. It actually goes like this. It says, I weep and I wail when I think upon death and behold the image of God lying in the grave, bereft of all form, eaten by worms. He carries on. Oh, paradox. <laughs> or paradox. What is this mystery, this mysterion, which would be the Greek word for sacrilege, it is. What is this mystery which befalls us? Why have we been given over to death? by the command of God who gives us the power to rest. It's a movement from one level of looking to another level of looking. It's a movement from the synoptics to the Gospel of John. It's a movement from transformative vision. It's a movement from a funeral lament to a song alleluia. Yeah? And it's that transform transformation of vision that theology is all about. Theology is not just simply a bunch of information in a system. It's a changed way of looking at things. Precisely with a view to the point of view of death and this transformation of vision in the light of Christ's own passion, trampling down death by death. And then the other thing I want to say, picking up on what you were uh, addressing in that, is what Gregory does, uh, just, and who's read it, I'm sure, all, all the others, is what he's talking about is the actual reality of the life of each and every one. It's not a matter of ancient history about the fall of this, that, and the other. It is. We can see from the womb, we grow by certain powers in the womb, we come out of the world, we continue to grow, we die. What differentiates, so that's common to every human being. You know, from the beginning, that's just what it is. You know? But what's common to Christianity, what distinguishes Christianity, is we voluntarily embrace the end, changing that. Um, passivity of death, again, fatality to mortality. Maximus Confessor talks that Christ has changed the use of death. Yeah? So we come into existence as passive victims, but in Christ, by the power of the Spirit, we can become active agents, taken to the cross voluntarily. But the end is common to all. It's simply human reality. So Christianity is not, you know, this is what it is to be human. And some people believe these odd things and behave in strange ways because they hope whatever. No, it's what it is to be human that we're already voluntarily embracing and entering into. It's, it's a completely different way of looking at it. Alright, we can do these last two up there. Yeah. Uh, just a quick clarification uh, with this arrested <laughs> anthro theological, Christological process. Um, does this apply, and I guess this is directed both towards Gregory, Gregory and towards your intended use of Gregory, does this apply to only each individual human life, or does this apply to the entire historical narrative of common human life um, both as a whole? Both and simultaneously. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Both and simultaneously. You know, my growth is from conception, birth, death, death of birth, it's a movement from Adam to Christ. That is a movement from Eric to Christ, but it's also across time a movement of the whole human race together from Adam to Christ, the movement to the beginning and end. And those movements are the same movements. Yeah? You know, if I'm being really provocative, slight, slightly provocative, not feel so happy to be sleeping so far. You know, I would actually say those movements are really not just recapitulating, but they are the same movement. The world came into existence when I was born. And it will end when I die. Yeah? It ended when Christ died. Our ends are all coterminous. We all end at the same point. Christ end, the passion upon the cross, descending into heaven. That's the end of that scripture narrative. My end is at the same point. Your end is at the same point. Now, hopefully, your chronologically will be after mine. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's coterminous. <laughs> yeah? So initially, it's the same movement. You know, building up the body individually collectively. Back to Paul's hand for the view of the temple, individually collectively. Thank you. Um, given this beautiful notion uh, that you've given us from Gregory of you know, Adam, the, the human species comprising all of its individual members, upon the
business and logic as you understand it, um, in his view, can any of us be saved if we are not all saved? <laughs> oh, well, he would say absolutely not. I mean, it's just, he, he should be talking to you know, about the nature, right? Uh, correct kind of about the nature of the But there's no doubt about it. He, he, he's kind of totally universal in that book. Yeah, it's a catastasis from Grandon. God will be all in all, not all in some, or a great deal for many. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out this afternoon. Um, it's been a real treat. I think we've all been uh, exercised uh, a good deal. Um, for those that are, uh, if RSVP for dinner, we're gonna do that in here. Um, and do you need to say anything else about that? Just dinner will be here by 5.30, so. 5.30, so <laughs> stay and linger and then don't. <laughs> anyway, thank you all and have a great rest of your day.